Welcome to our latest transition webinar designed to help secure a sustainable future for your farm business. I'm your host, Johan Tasker. When we talk about a sustainable future for farming here at Farmers Weekly, we mean a future that is sustainable financially, not just environmentally, and that means profitable farming. In this webinar, we're going to learn how precision farming can help profitability by optimizing the ratio of farm inputs to farm outputs, boosting efficiency and productivity. Precision farming in some form or other is used across some 60% of UK farmland, ultimately helping to feed the world. And in this transition webinar, we're going to explore how using technology can improve your farm business, how to unlock the full value of the information in your farm records, and how to reap the rewards of a data-driven approach to farming. And to help us do that, let me introduce our panel of experts. Dr. Tricia Toop is Delivery Director for the UK Agritech Centre, dedicated to accelerating innovation and the adoption of agricultural technology across all farming sectors. Rupert Harlow is Marketing Manager at Data Specialist Jagro, crunching numbers and information to help farmers get the best from their businesses. And Max Staffon is Digital Campaign Manager for Life Sciences company Bayer Crop Science, which is behind an increasing number of te technological tools enabling farmers to farm more productively, profitably, and sustainably. I think what I'm going to do, we know that... Um, Agriculture, precision farming in agriculture is very much a broad church. I'm going to ask each of our experts to just spend a couple of minutes explaining a little bit more about uh, what they do. Uh, Tricia, I'm going to start to start with you. Give us a couple of minutes as to what you do as delivery director for the UK Agritech Centre, please. Yeah, so um, the UK Agritech Centre um, basically, we, um, we offer sort of a complete life cycle of support to help um, companies develop um, agri-tech um, in a really sustainable way. So to make sure that it's economically as well as environmentally sustainable um, and help that through to the adoption. So we're really aware that actually it's not um, good enough for it to have the best things developed if they sit on a shelf and they're not adoptable at farms. So actually we do this through an infrastructure of um, world-class experts across um, all of the, the sectors of farming um, and linking that through to commercial farms that we have within a network where we can take those to test and demonstrate and actually to link that real sort of technology solution to a real farming problems because we're aware that actually if we break that link, then actually we have technology that's developed in a way that no farmer would be able to adopt it. So that's um, one of the core offerings we have within, um, within our centre. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, Rupert, um, same question to, to you, really. What, uh, what do you do? What do you get up to at Yagro? Thank you. So a farm will have or be collecting data or farm records or information, whether it's from their combine telematics or they've got their farm management softwares, weather stations, you've got a huge variety of, of information that's being collected in some way, shape or form. We collate that into a central location. We'll clean the data, structure it, verify that there aren't any extra zeros that are sort of jumped in there somehow. And then we present that back to a farm in a way that adds value to them and insight into their numbers in a way that they can they can learn from it or they can act upon it uh, to have a make a more informed decision, um, focusing on cost production and, and gross margin rather than rather than chasing a yield. Thank you very much. And, and Max, the same question to you, please. What, what do you get up to at Bayer Crop Science? Yeah, so um, I'm very fortunate working within Bayer. I get to get involved in a whole range of uh, digital farming tools. Um, when I joined four years ago, I was responsible for launching FieldView, which is Bayer's flagship digital farming platform, which uh, essentially is there to provide real-time data collection across a range of uh, farming equipment um, and it allows growers to sort of make sense of all of that data that they're collecting and, and start to to interrogate interact and get value from some of that information 
Um, I'm now involved in an increasing number of digital decision support tools from Bayer, which we're looking to, to bring to the market in order to support the, the rest of the portfolio, whether it's seed or CP um, that, that we sell. Uh, and a good example of that, um, which we're launching this summer, is, is a device called Magic Trap. So this is an Internet of Things connected device uh, for monitoring pest pressure in oilseed rape and allows you to get real time information back from the field. So those are the kind of the tools that we're, we're working on. And we also um, are looking for uh, opportunities to integrate with other uh, digital platforms in the industry um, in order to sort of provide combined solutions to growers and agronomists. So this is all about um, optimizing uh, what the farm business does in, in a way that's uh, sustainable uh, in terms of productivity, profitability, and indeed uh, the environment too. We've got uh, quite a few questions already in. If, uh, if you'd like to ask a question yourself, please do use the, uh, the chat box um, facility and we'll try and uh, get as many of those uh, questions uh, answered um, as we can as we go through the evening. We've got uh, just over an hour, about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to start by, um, Max, I'm going to start with you. Where should somebody start um, when it comes to uh, precision farming? What should... Uh, what, what 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 should a farmer? What should somebody be doing when they want to to get involved in the uh, in the precision side of things? Um, I think there's so much technology and so many options out there now. The first thing a farmer should really do is understand what their objectives are and what they want to achieve from precision farming or the latest bit of technology that they want to adopt. Because I think without that kind of clear set of objectives, you you don't know. What you're aiming towards and then therefore you know what is the best solution to try and meet that that problem that you're trying to solve but also i think it's really important when adopting new technology to actually to benchmark that uh, and to measure it against what you set out to do um so i would say that's the, the first thing that i would recommend is a is a clear outcome of, of what you want to achieve from a, a new piece of technology and indeed, I guess, like you say, benchmark. So find out where you are at the moment um, before you decide where you want to get to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, understanding that that base level um, or if there's a particular problem that you have on farm or, you know, your objective might be to try and increase yield or to reduce input costs. You know, it's a, there's a whole range of kind of business objectives there. Um, and the technology that you adopt um, is, is going to be dictated uh, by that. Okay, R Rupert. Uh, same thing, really. Is that something you'd agree with? Uh, uh, what Max has just said. Yeah, I, I, the making sure that the return on on whatever your investment is is crucial. So, you, understanding where you stand now, what value it's adding over time. If it's not, then going to continuously add that value. Is it worth continuing? Like, what we've seen. And, and is really important is making sure that that adoption isn't just the farm manager or, or the person that's leading the charge. And it's getting buy-in from everybody on the team. They might not be the one using that piece of kit or, or technology, but they might be recording some of the information or doing another process that's involved. So the whole business needs to adopt it, not just have one innovator that's the early adopter. Okay, and, and, and Trisha? Yeah. I mean, I agree with uh, with both Max and Rupert. Um, it is absolutely key to really sort of hone down on what your next challenge is that you need to solve and actually say, you know, that's the bit that we're going to focus on. Um, there are so many technologies out there that it would be really easy to take a scattershot approach and sort of have a bit of lots of different things. But then that would be really difficult to sort of prove um, which of those are really working for the business and which of those aren't. And um, what Rupert said that without that sort of across the piece adoption, without everybody really buying in to making that work, then it's really going to be difficult um, for that to embed. And we've definitely seen that on some of the farms that we've worked with, where maybe um, the owner has got a real buy into a particular technology, but the herdsman um, or, or one of the other operators is like, do you know what, that's just adding time to my day and I can't see the reason for that. And it's like, yeah, probably at the beginning when you're getting that technology um, in and you're working out how to use it, there'll be a little bit of a learning curve and it might be a bit 
more problematic. But actually, once you've got through that piece and you've got through the pain point of um, getting something on farm, that's when the real benefits come through. So you have to have that complete support to get that embedded to a point that you just go, actually, now we can see that through. So and without that complete buy-in, you'll never get through the pain point. Somebody will just like be, where are those collars? And they're in a box in the shed and they're not on the cows and that doesn't help. And, and, and that's going to in, involve a change of mindset, I guess, for for, for a lot of people, not just uh, farm workers, but uh, but it can also require a, a change in mindset in the other way around with, with the business owner as well, when a member of staff might uh, might see the value in doing something and need to persuade the boss that uh, there should be a little bit of investment there to 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 facilitate the update, the uptake of that technology, so it can be can be used, I guess, Tricia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and also one of the things that you've got to think of um, and some of the barriers we've seen some from some farm staff is they might see that actually the farm owner is trying to measure maybe the variability in the, the, the cattle or whatever, but actually almost be seen as oversight of the farm staff. So actually you might be able to see um, an event um, such as maybe the cattle getting out of a field that actually maybe the farm staff wouldn't necessarily want the owner to see and they wouldn't have had visibility before. So actually what we need to do is just be very aware of um, the barriers that we think um, the perceiver there might not actually be the ones that are why the farm staff or, or people aren't wanting to adopt it. So we have to sort of look at the social aspect, which is actually the third pillar of sustainability um, that is harder to do and harder for to perceive, but actually might be one of the barriers, the main barriers to the adoption of the precision farming tech. So change, change of mindset, getting staff on side. Max, is, is that something that you encounter in your line of work? It's um, Yeah, we've, the, the, we've definitely come across that. And I think, yeah, Trisha's comments around <clears throat> operators are, are extremely busy people. They've got a job to do and they've probably got a small window in order to get that job done. Um, and they really don't want to be spending more time than they need to inputting data. They've probably inputted in another screen already, asking them to do additional tasks. All they want to do is, is get on with the job that they need to do. So, um, yeah, I fully agree. I think it's about bringing them on, along with the journey uh, with you uh, and really demonstrating to them the importance of the data that is being collected. Because, you know, if it takes a few minutes at the start of a job to set it up, but it means you're going to collect good quality data it's only with that good quality data that you can achieve sort of the next step uh, and you can use that to inform future decision making um, quite often we see you know the the data that's been recorded through telematic systems if it isn't properly um, kind of implemented and um, curated it can become very very messy very quickly uh, so you've got applications being recorded all under the same field. Um, you've got no details of what the, those applications are. You've got false cropping in. Um, and, it, you know, it's that old adage, if you put rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. So you really do need to demonstrate what you know, the reasons why you want to collect this good quality data um, and also you know, make sure there's there's emphasis on on doing that. Thanks. And, and, and Rupert, I mean, you know, rubbish in, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and the workload, it doesn't have to be difficult, though, does it? Uh, this, this stuff, some of it can be automatically corrected. It should be. And I think that's only going to improve as the recording of data is easier. As Max said, if you've got a job and you've got to spend two minutes setting it up in the first place, if you go into a field to start combining and you haven't turned your telematics on or switched it over to record the new field, you, you've got rubbish. You've got rubbish data before you've even started to combine. So, as technology improves, that ease of ease of use and therefore ease of adoption is only going to is only going to ease up. And, going, and with this mindset thing, I mean, I, I guess. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people pride themselves on doing a good job, and this isn't a case of um, of technology putting um, somebody out of a job. It can actually make uh, make your job and make your life easier. Um, the, the example I'm thinking of is if you look at something um, 
that many people will be familiar with, such as GPS, you know, driving up and down the field in a straight line or plowing in straight furrows, etc. Technology can help you do that better, but some people will, this is that mindset thing, think, well, no, I can do it perfectly well on my own. Um, but, but we need to perhaps accept that there is, it's about working smarter, not harder, I guess. Max, Max, would you? Well, okay, okay. Trisha, I'll come to you, and then let's go. Let's go to. Let's we'll go to Max afterwards. Yeah, I mean, um, and it is, you know. So we've got a lot of people, and we, and we should be proud of, you know, the expertise we have in sort of farming in the UK. Um, but actually, um, if if you've got that and it can drive up and down on its own actually you're tired or you can be assessing other parts so actually you could be looking at you know rather than seeing where you're driving you know is that drill working effectively and things like that we've seen it also in the livestock um, sector as well so we were working on a project and i won't name any names um, throughout this because obviously it, it wouldn't be fair on a particular project and um, and we it was a livestock and it was a monitoring for early detection of um of uh, animal health problems and we had it on a, a brilliant farm and to be honest an absolutely top-notch herdman and he said i will find you know i'll see if any of my animals are sick before that detects it and um it had pinged up an alert and he went to see the animal and he said nope that definitely hasn't got pre-pneumonia we're fine um and then a day later it did and he was like actually that really woke him up he's like there were no outward signs that he could pick up so that precision technology is actually picking things up that even the best um people we have couldn't and he properly checked that animal over i mean it wasn't a glance it was a you know really looking at that so what it can do, it can actually make the best better. Um, so that would allow um, that person to sort of maybe have more people, uh, more sort of animals in the herd because actually he wouldn't have to spend as much with each animal, but they'd still have that oversight. And it's the same, you know, if if you've got that auto steer, that, that tractor is driving itself, actually you're going to be less tired at the end of one field, so maybe you could do another. Um, so it's just that it's, we need to get more out because we don't have enough people to farm the systems that we have. So actually, will that technology, can that take some of the load off and allow us actually to be um, a little bit more socially responsible for the farmers that we're actually breaking by making them work all of the hours and, and whatever and give them that breathing space that they need to do their jobs as well as they really are? Okay, thanks, Trisha. We've got some questions coming in that I'm going to uh, going to start going into in a moment. But uh, but Max, um, your your view on what uh, Trisha's just said? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, <clears throat> I think with with new technology and particularly around decision support tools, often what we hear is, you know, is this going to make the decision for me, or oh, I don't need to go and visit the field. And I think that that's completely the the wrong take on it. I think with some of this algorithmic decision making it, it should support a decision that still needs to be made by an individual but actually it's making that decision just looking on the data you know it's a completely unemotional uh, decision it's not thinking about last year's season and with that in the back of its mind it's just looking at the data at hand to make a recommendation based on on the you know how that algorithm is, has been programmed um, and it's just like having a uh, you know a gps in your car it's showing you or suggesting a route. It doesn't mean you have to follow that route if you think there's a the better route to take. And I think that's something that we all need to, to kind of get used to, um, that this this information can support our decision-making and it's not necessarily there to try and take those decisions away from us. Although we know what can go wrong when you do uh, sort of ignore the blue line in your car and try and, uh, try and beat the sat-nav sometimes. It's, uh, sometimes it works, but more often than not, it knows better than, uh, better than we do the, the right way to yeah. get somewhere. It um, does, but I think, you know, the important thing is you're, you're still in control over the decisions that you take, yeah. aren't you? So it's, sure. it's suggesting, and, and most of the time it is right, like you say, but you're, you're the one that makes the final decision on that. Sure, sure. Rupert, how about you? Is that, is that the same for you? I think I think Max's point on taking the emotion out of it. A lot of farmers they they they're, they're born on the land and therefore they are going to have that emotional attachment. And some of the field analysis we do, you you have someone will say, "Well, that is my worst performing field," and you can you can see that before they before they've told you because it's actually how they've treated it 
when they've harvested it, how much nitrogen they've put on it, when they've got around to spraying it off. And actually, the, perhaps the reason it's the worst is because they have a bias against that field rather than rather than, than, than the, the true decision and, and, and the technical behind it. So taking the emotion out and allowing technology to, to guide or help justify a decision is invaluable. Good. So we're, we're clear then it can help you make better decisions. It can make your job easier. It can help you work smarter, ease some of the pressure, take some of the load off, working smarter, not harder. Some of the questions that I've got, I'm going to address this one um, straight off because it's a variation a variation of these uh, of this question is coming about three or four times already. Uh, so this is from Anon. I'm going to read it out. Uh, we're on a 50-ish hectare arable farm. The lowest software subscription cost can be a barrier. Can suppliers look at that to increase the number of small farms participating? Um, there's another one here from uh, Marcus Webb who says, is there a model that can work for small-scale farmers to allow access to technology to improve efficiency, uh, etc.? And uh, so uh, Ruth Lubanga has asked, where does small-scale vegetable farming lie? And Richard Allen, how can the smaller producers, uh, 250 acres uh, being an example that he cites, justify the cost of all this technology and keeping it up to date? So I think the question is, what what is there out there for uh, a small a smaller farmer we look at this technology often it has this reputation for being extremely expensive and only the preserve of, of, of the big boys Rupert I'm going to start with you where do a smaller uh, family farms uh, and often one person bands uh, sit it sit in this what can they do and it depends what your what your definition of technology is because if you look at some of the new seed varieties coming out there there's a huge amount of technology that's gone into developing more disease resistant varieties um excel we i use excel on a daily basis it is still a technology so yes some of the more advanced tools are are expensive and harder to justify for a smaller business but there are tools and if used properly the likes of a gatekeeper can add incredible value, but you need to be trained on it and it needs to be a user-friendly experience. And one of the one of the best examples I've seen of someone using gatekeeper was an ex ex gatekeeper trainer, and they turned into a farm secretary. And their ability to get value out of it was because they knew the product inside out. So using tools but just making the most of what you have got and the tools you have available to you as well it, it's I, I don't want to put you on the spot Rupert, but do, but is there a is there an entry level package for for somebody who wants to get involved with Viagra and Max I'm, I'm going to ask you the, the the similar question with some of the tools that Bayer Crop Sites have, uh, have developed and then Trisha I'm going to sort of ask you what uh, what what small what what the options are for smaller smaller farmers but Rupert I mean, do it, how small can you be and still benefit from from some of the tools that you use ah uh... Our, our sort of entry level is around 500 acres. That's partly down to what it costs us to, to run, but it's also partly down to what we have seen farms recording and those that would actually use our services. We haven't seen, and it's a, a mass generalization, we haven't seen the, the data recording on smaller farms um, at the same level as larger farms. Um, but it is it is an issue which as the tools develop, they will get cheaper with more adoption. Um, but I, I completely recognize that as an issue at the moment, yes. And, and, I, and I guess the sort of the, the um, enterprises that you're involved with are gonna be mainly combinable crops, yeah? So, so we're not talking about a, a very small, but highly uh, specialized uh, um, um, uh, uh, arable or horticultural um, um enterprise we're talking about more broad acre uh, uh, crops for the yeah. agro is that right but yes but i mean when you get to those smaller crops or when you get into to orchards and vineyards and 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 salad 
it's a smaller area, but it's a it's a higher cost of production. So you can justify spending more on the technology because your output is much higher. So sure, thank you, uh, Max. How how about fair crop size? Yeah, <clears throat> I think some of the. Um the cost of some of this technology has has decreased significantly as it's become more widely available i think if you take something like satellite imagery for example to, to in order to enable you to monitor the biomass or field health in your fields i mean that the cost of that is has come down and it's even possible to get it you know for, for free from some providers now so i think in terms of having access to some of this technology for smaller producers that's becoming more accessible i think the, the bit that is more challenging is obviously implementing a, a decision based off the back of that information um but within yeah within bay we're also working on a range of decision support tools which i think again would be applicable to any business they don't necessarily need precision equipment in order to, to apply something but if it's a a tool that is going to help you get the most out of a product or advise you you know when it should be used or how it should be used then that that's something that any farmer could could benefit from regardless of size i would say okay thank you Trisha, options for smaller producers yeah i mean there's a there's a lot of options out there and i suppose i'm i'll i'll I've been talking a bit to the fa um, to the um, animal side because obviously um, uh, Rupert and, and Max is, you know, there are lots of different options for different um, meth modes of farming, and it's always going to be a challenge if you've got a small farm as to sort of what sort of profitability you've got, and we're definitely seeing the price of things coming down. So if you were looking, say, at cameras for um, looking at, say, body uh, conditioning scoring um, for some of the farms, you know, um, 10 years ago, cameras were really expensive um, when you'd go out and, you know, there were, there were any sort of camera. And now, you know, you've got cameras in phones that are better than two or three hundred or four hundred pound cameras that we were buying 10 years ago. So that technology is coming down. We're seeing um, uh the larger adoption, you know, and then, you know, you get the um, economies of scale of production. So things are getting cheaper. But I think the options for small scale farmers is, is look around. So actually don't assume that you can't afford it. Talk to the company, see if there's some adoption. And we've been doing a bit of that within the UK Agritech Centre. So we have 25 um, commercial farms across the UK that we work with and we work on how we can adopt and although we're a relatively large company um, for, for that, we have some really small scale farmers. You know, we have um, some that have sort of small um, 50 or 60 head of cattle um, and things like that. And we work with the companies and go, so what would you do with that farm, with that farmer? How would you apply your tech and what model would you use to make it so that actually if we weren't take, if we weren't paying for that, would they be able to do that? And we really challenge those companies um, and push them to say, you're not going to get the adoption across the piece if you don't bring this down because, you know, there isn't the money to pay for this. So you're actually developing something that nobody can buy. So that's not a business model that you can afford and it's not a business model that farming can afford. But equally, I guess, as Rupert says, these things will filter down to, 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 to things do become cheaper, don't they? The greater uptake uh, oh, that there is. This, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're seeing definitely seeing some technology that maybe was developed for the dairy sector that had had um, large scale adoption is now being spun out into sort of the beef and sheep um, where you maybe have um, maybe less money or, or um, smaller um enterprises and actually um, because all of the development costs had gone on the higher value or the larger sector then that actually then um, the development costs to just spin it through to a different sector aren't there and, and the companies are able to do that thank you thanks anything to add on that rupert i think the costs of technology is is an interesting one when we when we started developing our tool, our sort of current system, four years ago, we we had a grant through Innovate UK. Um, you need, you can't have farmers paying and developing that very early adoption, those innovators. And, and it's understanding that, that adoption curve of technology and 
when when does it become a, a viable product that farmers need to pay for when it when you need to prove that value first and that's wonderful that you have got those those grant systems in place to do it so um and and then as as you get into the adoption curve and into the sort of um those later adopters you you are getting cheaper but the earlier you adopt it the more value you're going to get out of it if you're if you're a couple of years ahead of somebody else so so and, and um, talking of, um, of grants, Max, the, uh, there's a question here. Harry Henderson, some of you might know, is the DEFRA Small Technology Investment Fund well placed to help drive the digitization and management of, of agriculture? Could it be, could it indeed be better? I mean, there are grants there um, from people like Innovate UK, also grants for DEFRA grant, grants to improve technology, etc. Do, do, do these are these grants of something that farmers should be considering, Max, uh, when it comes to adopting technology, or do we get into this case where people sort of see it as free money and maybe purchase something that might be a little bit inappropriate for their needs? <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know too much about that, but I think, um, you know, if you look at some of the incentives that are out there now under <clears throat> SFI, for example, whereby farmers will now be able to get paid for targeting crop nutrition uh, based on requirements. So whether that's variable nitrogen from satellite imagery, for example, I think that's a real positive step in the right direction. And I think with technology like variable nitrogen, actually measuring the return on investment for that approach is very difficult you know are, are you actually there are you saving nitrogen are you increasing yield and how do you go and measure measure all of that um so i think getting a kind of a, a tangible return or measuring a tangible return can can be difficult but you know you you know in your mind is is probably the right thing to be doing you know if you've got a very thin area of crop in a field you shouldn't be applying the full rate of nitrogen to it. Of course, you should cut back. Um, and if you know if you've got an area that's got higher potential, then that, then that should get a higher rate. So, I think um, having uh, incentives uh, or you know um, yeah some some schemes where farmers can can get paid to adopt that type of technology will really help the adoption and at least you know gives farm some farmers the confidence to to give it a go if they're not using it already. Tricia, grants grants for producers. Yeah, I think, to be honest, um, we definitely see some benefits from that. And um, we we uh, see it from both sides. So um, I'll, I'll probably put my hand up early on is we work with um, DEFRA and we feed back on some of the technology that's going um, onto the fund. Um, and actually, we feed back about what we see coming through. So what would the next technology be that we think should be going on to there? Um, what we can see on the return on investment? And could it be better? Well, nothing's perfect. We need continuous improvement in everything we do. But actually, I think it does really work. Um, you know, I know that they've been looking at how they can score things more effectively to see, you know, um, what should be on there and what shouldn't. And when should something actually come off that? When it When is it completely adopted? And, and when would you take that off and say, actually, that's just a generic piece of farm kit that some people, somebody should be buying? And I've seen some real positive changes on farms where people have used um, used that to actually buy a piece of equipment and have turned around to me and said, you know what, that has been a game changing piece of equipment. We had one farmer that had um, bought some robotic slurry scrapers. I mean, obviously not the most um, uh, fashionable piece of kit does something that actually is a job that nobody wants to do. Um, and their water usage went down the, um, the amount of time that they had people um, scraping and cleaning their dairy went down. And actually, um, that had a knock-on effect. The mastitis rate, the hoof health, everything in their herd, just from that investment. And actually, do you go, that was, you know, something that they probably couldn't have afforded without the grant, but actually has made a huge difference to their farming operations. So, you know, I do think they should. I do think they are well placed, and we've seen some real, um, we've seen some real positive stories. But I'm sure for every positive story I've got, there is um, a piece of equipment in a shed that was used for six months and not not used again. Um, so, but people don't generally tell me about those. 
that, that, yeah, the, um, we've all sort of heard the, heard those stories, haven't we? The people who can't resist a bargain, whether they whether they need it or not. But um, yeah, the um, I was going to sort of move on a, 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 a little bit to um, the, the 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 sort of the variable rate application um side of things because that is if i can just find here we are stephen tompkins what why do you think the uptake of variable rate technology is still relatively low given that it, the technology has been around for over a decade Let's go to max and then rupert i'll ask you sort of what so where, is that something that um Yagway works with or do, do you sort of are you more about measuring and getting the best from the systems that are in place at the moment or do you sort of work to 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 improve um, farming farming systems and make them more more precise um through what you do but uh, but max this other, that, that question the uptake of variable rate technology is still relatively low despite it being around for some time is that a return on investment thing um, I think it could be a mixture of things. I think, um, I mean, the obviously the adoption rate amongst larger farming businesses is much higher. So I think it comes down to that that kind of scale issue that we were talking about earlier, and actually some of the smaller farmers being able to afford the equipment in order to make use of that uh, variable rate technology could be one of the the main barriers i would say um so yeah i think the that adoption rate by size uh, there's probably a, you know, a, a graph that, that increases as, as you get bigger um but i think like with any technology there's a um there's a, a behavioral change that has to go alongside with it uh you know your it's not just a case of getting your field scanned and then being able to go and do something you actually need to be able to to create the plans once those plans are created there's a job to load them into the tractor um and uh, you know again there's, there's there needs to be support around doing that um and we know that if you know if a farmer needs to to go and spread variable nitrogen for example and they have some plans and they try and load them and it doesn't work they're not just going to not do the job uh, and then go and try and get help and, and you know get that sorted. They're, they're going to have to crack on and, and get the field spread. So I think the 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 adoption is can be limited by yeah the, the support experience or, or willingness for farmers to to do something different and, and try something new that's outside of, of what they're currently doing. Um, and many may feel that they're they're already doing a sufficiently good job without needing to adopt the what they perceive as a more expensive technology. Okay, thanks. Rupert? When, when you have such sort of volatile fertilizer prices, it becomes more of an interesting topic, I suppose. What we saw in the data coming out of the last couple of harvests after the prices went up was a huge range in those that have obviously said, we'll do what we did last year, we'll just pay a lot more for it and crack on with our 220 kg um, and others where they'd kept their spend the same, so they must have done something completely different. It When we look at those that use variable rate nitrogen, overall their farm use doesn't change the amount of nitrogen applied, their yields might increase, but across a field they're, they're on average putting on the same amount just in different areas of the field. But there are so many other areas if you are a smaller farmer and you can't you can't afford that technology there are if you if you change the amount of nitrogen you're applying if you look around and see if you can do a straw for muck deal if it's not even a fertilizer thing and it's or it's in your rotation or it's understanding your drainage and you haven't drained those fields versus and those ones you have and they're getting a higher yield there are so many different elements that just looking at a at variable rate doesn't necessarily answer everything. So, so with that in mind, a, a question here, Rupert, how can farmers ensure that they effectively use and interpret the data generated by precision farming technologies? Is that a question that you could answer? Um, I, I, I hope so. Um, I luckily have a, there's a whole office full of very smart analysts that do a huge amount of, of that um, at Yagro, we have computer systems that do it as well. It depends on what you want 
to understand and what you're looking to find out. And it, it was something that mentioned at the start of this webinar that you, you first need to understand where you currently stand, but also have your objectives mapped out of what you want to achieve. Because if you say, what would you like to know? You don't know what you don't know. Um, but in terms of understanding your field performance, if you lay out your five year field performance to see which are consistently outperforming and underperforming, be that by cost per ton produced or be that by yield, what do you want to overlay on that chart? Do you want to look at drainage? Do you want to look at fertilizer use? Do you want to look at rotation? So it's, it's, it's a never ending cycle of looking at different things, tweaking and adjusting what you're doing um, and, and never, as long as you never say we'll do the same as we did last year, I think. Okay. Okay. Max. Yeah, I think um, uh, a good way of making sure that you're getting the most out of the data is, is ensuring that you've got good interoperability or compatibility between the different systems that you use. Um, so you know, making sure that the, the equipment that you've got, uh, you're able to, to gather the data from that and then interact with it or use it in another platform. Um, I think, you know, one of the the worst things which still unfortunately happens is farmers are yield mapping and they may have been yield mapping for years, but that, that data can just sit on a USB stick, um, whether it's in the combine or in the drawer in the office. And it's, you know, it's, it's of no value to anyone there. Um, so having tools that you can actually make sure that you're you're able to view uh, and interrogate the data i think is is really important otherwise you've invested in the technology to collect it and you're not you're not realizing the benefit of that so yeah data compatibility and interoperability i would say are really key and and trisha you're not you're nodding at that yeah yeah so we um we look a lot at um data integration or data integrators so actually um I can remember quite a few years ago an agronomist saying, look, I just want to go to a field and I want to pick up one app and I want to see all of the information from all of the different um, operations, all of the different analysis that's happened in that field on my phone while I'm sat on my quad bike. I don't want to be going through and picking up. And we've come a long way, but actually we're still not fully there. And there are lots of brilliant companies, um, and some of them are on this webinar, like Rupert's and, and Max, that are doing a lot, but actually, you know, we, we there is more to be done in that. And that's an area that we definitely see there's, um, there are some gaps in the market. So actually for the farmers to make best use of the data they've got, they need to be able to see that as the whole system because they're not farming one set of data, they're farming an agricultural system and it's complex and it's changeable. And it's probably one of the hardest jobs I know um, so actually, they need all of that to come through, not as data, as information that they can make decisions on. And the only way to do that is to get that integrated and layered and make that quite, you know, that easy for them to access in a way that they then know what what needs to be done. Um, and I might use the, the wrong term here, but actually, I think some of the AI advances, some of that machine learning and that looking at how that data can be used in a really smart way. Um, and converted so that it can be used and, and become information that the farmer can act upon is some of the next steps that we'll be seeing soon. Could, could you give an example of, of how that might be used? Yeah, so, so we're looking at, um, so we, look, we use some data integrators and we see some, um, and actually um, there, there are some in some really good news. So, so we have, there are some in for the dairy industry. And again, I'm going to try very hard not to mention names. Um, but actually, when we look at some other sectors, there, there aren't any. And when we say, well, why aren't they? Well, actually, you know, it's, there's a lot of um, learning that needs to go behind that. So actually, if we can, um, if we can speed that up by getting some of the machines to do that, so it's not as expensive for companies to develop, then actually we can bring that, that can be brought forward um, and be much more affordable more quickly um, than it is at the moment. I, I don't think we could expect, especially at the moment, to get through this um, this webinar um, on precision farming and technology without talking about uh, a, AI, usually in farming terms, we, we think yeah. it has been artificial insemination, but, but um, artificial intelligence, Rupert, is that, is that something that Yagra is looking at? In increasingly the, the the potential for it to again going back right back to the beginning um uh, uh you know something that can make our jobs easier rather than take over 
I mean, I, I, I was using chat GBT as a sort of AI tool today to Google didn't give me the right answer on biggest nitrogen exporters and chat GBT gave me a map of, of them and their, their sizes. But are we, 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 we've got a couple of projects. One was, um, one is looking at, at using AI to help clean and structure data and, and do some of that early analyst work to sort of free, free up to do more complex tasks. And we did a we did a project which we called Operation Crystal Ball, and it, it was a feasibility study with um, Outfield Technologies, who you have. So they have drones, and they'll fly across an orchard, and their their drone can capture how many blossoms are on an apple tree, and the AI will capture that, and then we can then take that information of it will predict a yield of X amount of apples, and they go well. This is how much you should be spending on it to make your profit of, of why. Whereas at the moment in farming, it's let's invest and put all these inputs in, then we'll get a yield and we'll see if it worked out. Whereas if you can predict your yield in advance and then tailor your tailor your investment to suit, I mean, it's changes, changes farming. That's fascinating. Max, uh, AI at uh, Bear Crop Science? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an area with yeah huge potential. Um, and one of the areas that, that we're looking at, we currently have a, um, a partnership with Microsoft uh, to develop a, 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 um, a cloud-based ecosystem called Azure Data Manager for Agriculture. And the idea of this is as well uh, as acting as a kind of a, a data connector and data integrator, um, uh, different stakeholders be able to plug in what we call kind of ready-made ag-powered services on, on top to access this data. Uh, and one of the areas that we're looking at is the development of a um, agriculture co-pilot, um, which is essentially a, a large language model, which will um, plug into a user's data uh, and it will allow them to interact with their data in a natural chat-like interface. So rather than having to trawl through lots of tables or graphs or, or uh, numbers, you'd be able to ask simple questions like, Know, which of my fields received the most nitrogen last year and it would give you an answer based on your own specific data uh, and then you could interrogate you know how did they yield for, uh, versus the others so it's about making the the ability to get the value out of that data that much easier through some of these ai large language model tools thank you thanks um i'm going to move on there's a there's a question we're going to come back to to the practical side of, of data at the moment, but I'm going to ask this question. Um, I'm going to ask it to everybody. But, uh, I'm going to start with you, Tricia. Uh, anonymous, how much of the data is, uh, I guess, generated uh, by uh, precision farming? How much of the data is useful to the supply chain? And, uh, and should they c contribute to the cost of adoption through ensuring adequate margins? This might be beyond uh, uh, the scope of this of this webinar, but is there is there a role? Do we think that um, it, the technology is is quite expensive? It will benefit the farmer, but also it could benefit other players within the supply chain, be it retailers, processors. Um, you know, Rupert was talking about um, blossom on trees and being able to use that to forecast the amount of. Uh, of fruit that might be produced and that is going to have a, a benefit for the grower but it's also going to have a benefit for I guess the processor and, and the retailer and the rest of the supply chain as well so do they should they contribute to the cost of adoption through ensuring adequate margins I ask it ask it to you Tricia and then and yeah. then Rupert and then Max I think that's probably the million dollar question um, for sort of ag tech and the data that's produced for it so actually um, individual um, farms there is probably very little value in that data um, to the supply chain it's when you get the large data sets when you can see those trends i mean obviously if if um, uh, produce is being produced in a, a more um, economically viable way then actually um, it's looking at that sort of those players and seeing where that most of that value is added um, I'm probably not going to go out on a limb and say, yes, the supply chain should be paying for that adoption because um, it's really tricky to say who's getting the most benefit and, and who isn't. 
So actually, if the farmer becomes more efficient and more productive and can continue in farming, then obviously they're getting a benefit if, um, if say, a supermarket, if that supply chain, if they're getting a better product um, at a lower price than that thing. But also as consumers, should we be paying for some of this as well? Because actually, if we're getting healthier products um, at a lower cost, um, is it's where does that burden and that benefit um, sit? Um, and actually, I'm probably, um, I'm still on the fence. I don't 100% know, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, where that would be, if I'm honest. Um, so I'm completely chickening out on the on the question. <laughs> Rupert, how about you? I can't I remember. Said, I said I was going to ask Rupert or Max next, but I'll ask Rupert and then Max. And I, I, can I can I preface this by saying this isn't looking at the the, the security of of your farm data and and how mm. that supply chain should then use it because I think we could spend an hour talking about the the right ownership and and how data should be looked after, but with with in, with things coming in such as the scope 3 carbon emissions targets where a company is now going to have to report what their emissions are and show an improvement mm -hmm. if that is a food producer they are going to need to understand from a, earlier in the supply chain what what the carbon cost was so they are going to have a duty to need to prove that and they're going to need the information from a farm but they're buying the grain or the the product from the farm do they also need to buy the data from the farm is that in the contract with the farm that if they're going to buy it and pay a premium say it's going into a maltsters they're already paying a malting premium is the data contract in with that as well but it's it needs it needs to be started to write them into people's contracts and go if you want if you want my data i want an extra five pounds or whoever's going to play the hardest ball i it's it's normally the higher up split the supply chain win but um it, it needs to be factored in sooner rather than later thank you and max yeah not a huge amount to add to this one i yeah you know, i was going to use the example of carbon as well i think it's a you know, it's a real clear um illustration of where farmers are adopting technology to, to monitor, record and verify potential carbon friendly farming practices, which will lower their carbon footprint of production and therefore lower their uh, the companies that they're supplying their overall carbon footprint. I think that's a, a real clear illustration, but whether those companies are going to start paying for the technology or, or the data, as Rupert suggested, I'm still unsure of that one. I think there are free apps out there. I'm thinking of, um, I'm not going to name them, but uh, I believe uh, beef breeding apps that people can use to to monitor the ongoing uh, and uh, to uh, daily live weight gain and, and growth of their uh, of their beef cattle to uh, ensure that it is um, uh, well. It, it enables the 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 it gives the market more certainty in what's coming and, and, and when things are, are, are matured. And uh, I think those apps are, are free to beef farmers or um, and paid for by, um, in some cases, by, uh, by others in the supply chain who, who reap the benefits from the, from the other end. And they are, they are easy to, to use. Um, let's look at some other Questions. I mean, if we bring it, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've, we've talked about is um, uh, let's bring it back to this year. We, we've had a really, really challenging year, one of the wettest winters and springs uh, that people ha have experienced. And we've, we see that um, uh, crop growth has been restricted, grass growth has been restricted. It's difficult to, to forecast yields to even know whether crops should be. Um, uh, ripped up and re-drilled, etc. Is there a is there a role for precision uh, farming? And we we are talking a lot about data this evening, which is which is fine. But is there is there a, a role for um, data and precision farming in in a year such as this? Does it sort of really come into its own in a year such as this, Max? Yeah, again, I, you know, I think a really good illustration is is around satellite imagery and using the satellite imagery to to maybe monitor the, the status of the fields, 
where you have got areas of failed crop, you know, it's very easy to then go and measure that area or measure the area of viable crop you've got left in a field, um, monitor the status of the crop. And I think not just for, for farmers, also for agronomists. You know, if you're an agronomist covering a, a large area, if you've got access to satellite data for your farmers, you can very quickly identify or prioritise which areas you might want to go and have a look at, um, you know, where you've got the, the, the largest problems um, and, yeah, you know, prioritise your, your crop walking accordingly. So I think that uh, having access to, to data and able to, to manage those dis decisions at scale can be really useful in a challenging year like this. Uh, and um, uh, Rupert, that's similar for you. I mean, you, you do stuff like real time tracking of crop performance and that kind of thing. Yes, I mean, if you know if you know what you've spent on your field and you've got a rough idea of what it's what it's going to return you, then you know whether to pump in more inputs or, or, or pull back. But I, I, on Max's point of of having sort of satellite technology, when when you've got an agronomist that's stretched and needing to get across multiple fields if you can live track in any way and and service everybody at once it's it it is it, incredibly useful but tracking tracking your your in season is becoming more important as prices become more volatile you've got a grain price that's shifting last year was it over 100 pound a ton you 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 need to be tracking and understanding what you've put in and and also managing your your grain sales as well and and that spread isn't it? that is is huge isn't it in terms of volatility and that can make an awful lot of difference over over not many acres at all or it doesn't take many acres at all at uh, at that 100 pounds a ton difference before um you the, 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 there's a huge difference in terms of overall overall margin profitability and again, I guess this is about optimizing margins rather than uh, rather than just um, trying to increase the yield at all, all costs. Sorry, Rupert. Yes, I mean if if you can if you can increase yield, fantastic. But it, yields do seem to have sort of plateaued somewhat from from sort of where they've come since yield rec recording started, and you're not you're not seeing you can't change your soil type. You can't change the weather, so you're not going to necessarily increase your yield unless we have some amazing new variety come out. So it is making the best use of what you've got, making the best use of your land or, or adjusting your land by understanding, is this SFI going to help me if I go and take on my no insecticide SFI to get a, is it 45 pounds a hectare? What impacts that going to have on, on my farm if I knock off insecticides? Um, so understanding understanding your business is it, 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 yeah it's crucial uh trisha you're sort of at the at the interface between a lot of the uh sort of tech companies that there are out there and and um uh, and what's happening in the field um what, what sort of things are coming down the line yeah i mean to be honest there's an awful lot of monitoring um there's yeah there's a lot of technology um around so we've gone we're going from sort of um field level um sort of monitoring and we're getting down to sort of plant level um and that sort of thing so actually when you're going from um larger scale precision it's now getting down to quite fine precision so some of the things that are coming over the horizon are per plant per animal um it's getting down to that really fine precise now Am I saying that those are going to be on the market, um, you know, now, but not necessarily, and there are some, but actually that's where we're looking at. It's that getting very precise and seeing how that can be applied. And actually that might um, have a higher adoption in some areas that we haven't seen it before. So the broad acre, there's been quite a big uptake on some, but actually when we start, um, and somebody had, had mentioned about sort of um, uh, the horticulture, you know, when we're looking at maybe vineyards, um, fruit, um, you know, the top fruit sector, actually, when you're looking at a per plant, if you've got a high value, you've got a, you can stand a higher level of investment in that per plant adoption, because actually that plant might have a really, really 
um, high yield. And if you can optimize that, if you can reduce any wastes, that really gives you a, a higher return on investment. So a lot of vision, a lot of machine learning, automated sort of image scanning and acting. That's uh, we're seeing a lot of that at the moment. And uh, if I'm listening to this, I might think, well, this all sounds really complicated and stuff. Is it becoming easier to use? There's a question here from Patrick Hallett who says, do you envisage farmers will be able to utilize the advanced technology without outside help or will this be a barrier to adoption for some i guess it will be a barrier for uh, to adoption for some but is it becoming easier you, to use without outside help or do we need to sort of call in the experts what, what do you think trisha it, it is becoming easier to use so that's one of the things that we definitely work with the technology adopters on um, and it's one of the reasons we've got the commercial farms because if our commercial farmers can't use it, nobody else is going to. So actually they're then pushed for that usability. Although actually we, we're also getting better at using technology. So when we look at the phones that we've got in our pockets now, um, compared to the phones we had in our pockets 10 or 15 years um, ago, if you had a phone in your pocket 10 or 15 years ago, actually we're much more technology savvy and people are using those interfaces that they're actually um, they know that people are aware of. And we've done some surveys in the past um, within the sort of UK Architect Centre looking at um, sort of whether farmers um, feel that, you know, that the technology they're using is fairly, um, is too much. We know that there will be some training needs, but actually all that will do is that may bring different skilled um, labour into the sector. So maybe where we're not being able to get people to do um, uh, jobs um, that they, they don't feel as attractive. We are actually bringing in um, people that sort of actually sort of the, the younger people that may be more tech based um, and they might be more interested in um, the ag sector jobs. When you're saying about using mobile phones t uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I was thinking, what did I have on my phone then? I was thinking, oh, it's probably Snake or Tetris. And then I realised yeah. it was uh, a whole lot, <laughs> a whole lot uh, further back than than even that yeah. one had the old uh, Nokia, whatever it was. But um, Rupert, your um, Jaguar, yeah, some of the, your stuff is, is that, that is is that available as an app? Yes, yeah, we we run an app, and hopefully you don't need to be an expert to use it. But are we when we look at experts, it's the farming community is is so different to every other industry in that it's full of experts as farmers so there are all the different forums out there and, and and farmers are more than willing to sort of give their time to others so if you're looking at an expert i think you can start by looking at other farmers that have already adopted a top a, a, a tech and and they'll give you free support so don't look at as as at having to pay for an expert um you are an expert in something yourself and and that'll be valuable to somebody else and you can give them something in return so, so making something easy to use is, is is sort of key, I guess, for your business because it increases uptake and it makes it more accessible and then you get that sort of um, you know, economy of scale that we were talking about earlier. And we have, um, we have UI and UX designers who are specifically there to look at how people in, um, interact with tools and how they'll get the most out of it and... Um, there's all sorts of technology we then use to understand how someone navigates through a system. So we we spend a huge amount of time trying to make things as functional as possible, um, so that so that it, you can speed up that adoption curve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Max, um, you mentioned magic trap earlier, um, monitoring pests in all seed rape. Is that is that is, a lot of these things are easy for for. I don't really like the phrase, but ordinary farmers to use. We don't have to be all uh, have a degree in IT or or, um, or whatever to be able to do this stuff. It is it is fairly accessible, yeah. Yeah, and I think you know, as <clears throat> farmers are also consumers outside of agriculture, and we're all used to the kind of the Apple experience now. I want to be able to turn on a, a device, and I should be able to use it without any kind of instruction. Um, and I think whilst agriculture has lagged. Um, it is getting better and I think there's you know a lot of the, the systems and the apps apps particularly I think are easier to get started and get used uh, than the kind of desktop applications but um, yeah they've become a lot lot easier a um, lot more intuitive uh, and a lot easier to kind of yeah, get your head around um, but I think an area where farmers still require support is where the where the software meets the hardware on farm 
So, you know, where, where the technology to create a plan meets the, the, the tractor or the sprayer that's going to go and implement that plan. I think there's so many different equipment configurations that you can have. And I think it's really important that farmers receive good support at, at that stage so they're actually able to, to go and implement and, and make the use of the technology that they've, they've adopted. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. We're coming sort of towards the end. We've got about 10 minutes left, I think. So um, we're coming towards the end. There's a, a question here from Bet Law. Um, Tricia, you've mentioned uh, stuff that's coming down the line. Uh, this question from Bet Law says, are there any trouble areas for farmers in particular that you feel would be benefited by technology and, and in what way? So uh, is, there, is there something there, Tricia, that um, you feel that, we're, that farmers would particularly benefit from, a problem there that's to be solved that we haven't really um, been able to solve yet? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you want the top 10? Um, no, you know, well, no. <laughs> well, give, us, give, us a, give us a couple. Give well, I think, couple. to be honest, there, there, are, there are a lot of challenges. And when you look at each sector, each sector will have a challenge. So I know Rupert and Max can really talk to the, the crop sector. So if I look at a farming one, maybe, you know, we're, we're looking to reduce um, antibiotic use um, in in any of the food so whether that's poultry whether that's sort of beef dairy and actually that's a big challenge because actually because that takes there's a whole lot of things go into that so actually the one health for both the animals and, and the humans that are consuming them that's a big challenge and that's one of the things that as a UK Agritech Centre we're trying to sort of help push on so some of that can be you know, pen side diagnostics, because if you have to send a test off to find out what's wrong with your animal, by the time you've got it back, you might have 10, 15 ill, and actually then you're having to treat them all with antibiotics. Whereas actually, if you can find out what's going on in your flock, in your herd immediately, then actually you can deal with that really quickly. You might be able to deal with that, with that without antibiotics, or you might be able to have just a really small amount. So actually that's a real challenge for the livestock sector because we're really demanding as consumers that healthy food, the supply chain is demanding that. And actually we should, because that has a knock on effect for our human health and all of that. So that one health ethos. So actually from a livestock perspective, that's a big one. We've been working with some really um, innovative companies looking at how that can be done in everything from um, aquaculture um, through to um, pigs, poultry, dairy, um, looking at some really sort of chemical free um, alternatives as well. So that's a big challenge that I think isn't going to go away. And actually, as more antibiotics resistance in the human food chain um, increases will actually become a bigger problem. And I'm not even touching on the climate sustainability one because I'm pretty sure Max and Rupert will will address that or one or the other of them that. So that's a, that that health perspective. I, I, I think I think especially in livestock, it always amazes me that sometimes this sort of technology can identify a problem or a need to to do something before we even oh. observe it or realise it as as humans. It's, Absolutely. It, yeah. Absolutely. And, and we've had some we've had some absolutely brilliant farmers go no 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 there is no chance that that thing that's in an ear or the little bonus you know I know my animals and and you know time after time it does it and and that's superb um you know it will really help take that forward so it's still a challenge but I'm absolutely positive we've got the technology coming through that will will help us address that Thank you. Thanks. Rupert, is there something, is there a problem that, um, that or a challenge that you could see that um, technology, you know, could over could overcome? Um, I, I think it's it's a topic that we've we've touched on lots of times here in the in the the challenge of recording information and, and, and storing it. And it's it's time consuming for people to do, whether that's plugging something into into gatekeeper or make remembering to turn something on or time it takes to to boot something up so taking away the friction 
making making something have less manual entry um we have pdf reading machines that can pick up an invoice and 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 drop that data straight in and if you've got that sort of system on farm and you can save a farmer any amount of time they're 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 clamoring for extra time today when they want to be out and spraying and, and getting jobs done not in the office filling out dull bits of data so their precision tech works properly thank you and, and max how about you yeah, I think um, uh, a challenge farmers are facing is the the uh, number of active ingredients available to them now, whether it herbicides, fungicides, insecticides is diminishing, and the number of new active ingredients coming to the market is is not coming at the same pace as it, it has in the past. So I think it's there's a, a real need to make the most of everything that you're you're putting on, um, and I think in the future, you know biologicals are, are likely to play a, a, a key part and I think decision support tools around the use of biologicals are going to become even more important because you know they may only work in situ certain situations or in certain uh, environments so actually having a tool to advise you on the, the best use of that and how to get the most out of that product and, and the, the biggest return I think is going to become increasingly important as the number of tools in the toolbox that farmers can use to, to grow their crops is diminished. Thank you very much. Um, I've got somebody at the door here, but I'm not going to get an answer. It, but there, there we go. They can, they can wait. We've got four minutes. I'm going to ask you each for your sort of take-home um, message. If there's one sort of message that you wanted people to go home with uh, this evening, uh, or think about after this, uh, after this webinar. Um, I, but just hold that thought for a moment, or think about that while so I sort of just recap a little bit as to as to what we've learnt. Um, when it comes to precision farming uh, i guess the messages are know what you want to achieve and where you want to get to and with that in mind measure where you are now uh, it can be a challenge to get staff on side and to change the mindset to see the benefit but that is vital uh, for if, if you want to get the best from precision farming technology ensure the data that you collect is accurate and the correct information so don't just uh, collect information for information's sake and beware of the old adage of uh, adage of garbage in garbage out and uh, remember that uh, using pre precision farming methods can take some of the load off you it can make the job easier and help you make better and impartial uh, business decisions by taking out the emotion some advanced tools yes they can be expensive but there are indeed options for smaller producers uh, there are grants available explore them but make sure you, uh, you you apply for the right ones and uh, make sure that they're going to be of benefit and don't just uh, buy something because it's uh, a bargain uh, we also touched on it being a challenging year and uh, in a year such as as this information uh, is it can be information is power as they say and it can help you make better decisions especially when you're tracking crop development and uh, crop performance and expenditure and tracking that performance can come into its own in times of volatility and uncertainty and uh, indeed uh, price volatility as uh, as well as um, uh, volatility when it comes to uncertain uh, weather um, so before we uh, before we say uh, good night and uh, go our way home, um, I'm going to ask. I'll start with Rupert, then Max, then Trisha. But Rupert, uh, take home message for anybody uh, listening or watching, uh, participating in this uh, webinar. What would it uh, What would it be for you? Your take home message, please. It would be that you do need you need to benchmark where you stand today because if you're going to invest in technology you're not going to understand how it's helping you unless you know where you stand today. Thank you. Max? Um, I would say that, you know, precision farming technology is such a broad topic. And uh, sometimes I speak to farmers and they say that they feel overwhelmed by the number of different systems and offers out there. I would say, you know, try and understand what you want to achieve from these technologies as a business and go and explore those offers. Don't feel overwhelmed. Um, just trying to gain a, a greater understanding of, of what they deliver uh, and then you know adopt those technologies that, that you think are, are going to best deliver what you're trying to achieve 
and make sure you go back to the beginning and, and measure out measure have you achieved what you set out to be uh, at the beginning thank you and uh, and and trisha your final thoughts as well please yeah um so my final thoughts is really um be um be curious um look at what's out there there is no one size fits all solution um sorry Trisha, oh. Trisha are, you, are you there your, yeah. your final thoughts yeah yeah so um be curious i'm going to switch my performance down because i think i'm losing a bit of bandwidth um be curious have a look at what's yeah, out there nice. you know see um see what you know what is applicable to you um basically you know um explore what's out there if you need help ask you know we're not all as experts in everything so actually there is no um there is no problem to ask people people will always be willing to help um and there are, are places like the uk ag tech center we we don't work with just one company or one technology um we're here to help and support um so tap into if not us that sort of independent help that can sort of um help you we, we're here to help the acceleration the adoption and development of agritech so so tap into those infrastructures that are there because they might help you find something that will make a big difference to your business right thank you thank you very much trish i did in the end have to go and get the uh, door they, were very persistent. <laughs> they weren't giving up were they no. <laughs> they, they, they weren't they weren't but, uh, but there we go right that uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this uh, farmers weekly transition webinar thank you to everybody for your questions and uh, and thank you to our expert panel for for answering them so uh, uh, dr trisha toop delivery director for the uk agritech center uh, rupert harlow marketing manager at data specialist siagro and max daffon digital campaign manager for life sciences company bayer crop science thank you all very much it's been a really interesting discussion for everybody listening you will be able to uh, watch this all again uh, if you so wish it will be available online there will be another uh, uh, Farmers Weekly Transition webinar in due course. If you want to find out where you can uh, watch the, the webinars, where you can sign up for more web webinars, and where you can learn more about the Farmers Weekly Transition project, you can visit fwi.co.uk slash transition. There'll be all the information that you need there. But, uh, but for now, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. Uh, I've been your host, Johan Tasker, and uh, I'll bid uh, everybody uh, a, a good evening and I'll go and uh, sort of sort out what's going on with the doorbell. But thank you very much. That's uh, absolutely lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.